Hello, biologists. This is Greg Kowalki again. Uh, I teach biology at Cleveland High School, and today we are going to start the evolution unit and record our initial ideas on evolution. Before I get started, I'd like to remind you of how to use these PowerPoints. Um, first of all, remember to work at your own pace. Your health and your family come first. If possible, you might help find it helpful to work with a colleague through this lesson. Uh, it's always good to have somebody around to bounce ideas off of uh, or to help answer questions. You might find it helpful to have a piece of scrap paper and a pencil or pen to record questions or ideas as you move through this lesson. You should read through the slides one at a time or take your time going through this video. Explore the images, explore the links, re-listen to me if that will help. Make sure that you understand this as you come out of this lesson. If you come across something that you don't understand, make a note of that and which slide on your scrap piece of paper and come back to it after you go through the whole PowerPoint. You may have your question answered as we move through this video. If you're still confused, email your teacher, ask someone in your household, or reach out to a colleague. When you finish, consider sharing what you've learned with someone in your household or a friend. Talk it through. It really does help you remember what you've learned to be able to explain it to somebody else. All right, so let's get started on lesson one, initial ideas in evolution. By the end of this PowerPoint, you should be able to define evolution, define scientific theory and explain why evolution is not just a theory, identify several things that you notice from a video and several questions that you have about how sickle cell disease evolved and persisted in populations of humans. But first, I'd like to start out with a warm up. So there again, grab a scrap of paper, and I'd like you to answer these two questions. What do you think evolution means? And what do you think of when you hear the word evolution? Pause this video, answer these questions. There are no wrong answers at this point. This is your initial ideas. Just want you thinking about what you already know. So pause this video. We'll come back in a moment. Now that you have recorded your definition of evolution, let's look at the biological definition of evolution. Evolution is the change in the heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. These characteristics are the expressions of genes that are passed on from parent to offspring during reproduction. Okay. So evolution is the change in traits that are caused by proteins that are coded for in genes on the chromosomes of DNA. And as those traits change over time in a biological population, that is evolution. It's traits in a population changing over time from generation to generation. And this is the process by which the different kinds of living organisms, the different species, are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. So evolution is the process by which we've got the large variety of species and organisms that we have right now on Earth that all came from a common ancestor billions of years ago. Now let's think a little bit about evolution as a scientific theory. Scientific theory in some, uh, is different from the way that we think about theories in uh, common language. Uh, in science, a theory is an explanation of an aspect of the natural world that can be repeatedly tested and verified in accordance with the scientific method using accepted protocols of observation, measurement, and evaluation of results. I don't want to go into too much detail about the scientific method, but this means that scientists have made observations about the real world. They have developed hypotheses about how those observations, what could have come about. From those hypotheses, they break that down into testable predictions and questions. Then they test it, gather the data, and that data either supports their hypothesis, their explanation of the observations, or it does not, in which case they will 
change their hypotheses, come up with new tests and new testable questions, and do that again. Whenever they find a hypothesis, an idea that consistently explains data and observations, that is always predictable, that is always able to predict the data that is collected, then it gets kind of elevated to a theory. All right. So a theory is an explanation of why a phenomena occurs, why we see the things that we do in nature. And a theory is just about as close to a fact that you can find in science. Okay? So a theory is something that has held true with every observation and piece of data that we have found. So it's a very strong word. By theory, we mean it's about as close to a fact as we're willing to admit. Scientists do not like to use the word fact. They do not like to think about things as being always true. We always allow for the possibility that we may observe something that is different, that does not fit into the theory, in which case we would refine or change or just completely throw out the theory and start over again based upon the observation that we make. So we always like to leave the door open for things to change, to, for observations that may be exceptions. But theories are ideas, are explanations of things that we see, of observations that we made, that so far have not been disproven by every test and every prediction we've made. Okay, so it's a very strong thing. It is very different from a law, though. So a law is goes through the same processes as a theory of formulating hypotheses, developing predictions, gathering data. But a law is just a description, uh, and it's usually a mathematical formula. So a law is kind of a direct prediction of what will happen next, and a theory is an explanation of why that would happen. So gravity is always a really good example of the differences between this. Uh, gravity, the law of gravity, is basically if I drop something, it will go down towards the Earth. In other words, things with mass pull on each other directly proportionate to their mass. So the bigger it is, the greater the strength of the force of gravity, and that it is inverse to the distance between those two masses. So the farther they are apart, the less force of gravity that they uh, exert on each other. This, I can put give you the equation for this too. This is a law. This is what is going to happen, but it does not tell us why. To tell us why, we need Einstein's theory of general relativity, which tells us that it is about masses, particles that have mass, bending space and time around them, very much like putting a bunch of marbles or something like that on a piece of fabric that you pull really strong. That fabric still bends a little bit, so if you put like marbles on top, they're going to slope in together and come together. Mass kind of does that to space and time according to the theory of general relativity. So that gives you the why. So a theory is why, a law is how. Okay. There is a video linked here and probably on Schoology as well that does a very good exam, uh, explanation of the difference between a theory and law. So I suggest that you pause this and watch that video. Right, now that you've watched that video and learned a little bit more about uh, theories and laws in science, uh, showing that a theory is actually means that we have a pretty strong explanation for the observations we see in the natural world, let's look at some of the evidence that supports that theory, that helps us know that it is a strong explanation of the natural world. So these are the observations that we've made that support the theory. So there's a lot of good evidence, a lot of good observations that support uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, this includes comparative anatomy, 
embryology and development, the fossil record, DNA, and the geographic distribution of species on Earth, just to name a handful of the stronger pieces of evidence. I'm going to describe these briefly. I'm also going to give you the link to a video that probably explains it better than I can. First is comparative anatomy, and that's one of our earlier pieces of evidence actually predating the theory of evolution of binatural selection. It is part of the evidence that got us thinking about evolution uh, and the causes of evolution. So uh, comparative anatomy is comparing structures between different species, different populations, uh, and looking at similarities that suggest that those species, those populations, may share a common ancestor. They may have had a great, 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 great grandparent uh, in common. And so many structures, uh, really important structures, have similar construction and structure uh, between different species. One of the examples is the one we see to the left here, and that is the construction of the forelimbs, the arms, of animals with backbones, of uh, vertebrates. And as you can see, we have a human, a bird, and a bat here, uh, animals that do not look terribly similar. Uh, but their forelimbs, their arms, have pretty much the same set of bones. They have a long humerus. They have two uh, bones, the radius and the ulna, in the forearm here. Uh, they've got the carpals um, that are your wrists that allow a whole bunch of different movement, the metacarpals which make up the hand, and then the carpals which are the fingers. All three of these organisms have the same sets of bones. Bird has a handful of less fingers and a little bit less to their metacarpals, but otherwise we have the same set of bones in all three of these, even though they don't all uh, perform the same function. So the function may be different, but the structure is similar. We use our forearms for grasping things and manipulating our environment. Birds and bats will use them for flight. Um, so very different things, but there again, the same bones, they may be longer, thinner, uh, different shape, a little bit of different shape, but overall about the same shape, the same order, uh, and the same sort of connections to each other, even though they're used for different things. This can also show us that they are not related. So, for example, birds and bats do have these bones, but some other organisms that fly, like let's say dragonflies, do not have these bones. So dragonflies may have structures that have the same function. So they may have wings, just like our bird and our bat do, but they don't have the same bones, which suggests that even though they do the same thing, they are not as closely related. All right. Next piece of evidence I want to talk about is embryology and development. We find that organisms that are more closely related have stages in their development as they grow from an egg to an adult that are very similar. All right. A good example of this is there again, animals with backbones, vertebrates, have stages as they go from an egg to an adult that are very similar. So for example, off here on the right, we have five different groups of organisms, fish, turtles, chickens, pigs, and humans. And as you can see, the fertilized egg looks about the same all across the board. Uh, eggs tend to look about the same. They're a single cell with a nucleus and all that. Very similar. And then when that egg is fertilized and starts developing and making more and more cells through cytosis or mitosis and uh, going through uh, cell differentiation, making different new, different types of cells by turning genes on and off, we develop into the next big stage, which is called a pharyngula. And as you can see, that's that second line down, the fish, turtle, chicken, pig, and human all look very similar. They actually all look like fish. They all have gills. Uh, they all have a long tail. Um, they all have little buds that are starting to turn into limbs, uh, and in most cases, just the front ones. So they all look very similar. So at this stage in development, all of these organisms look almost exactly the same. It's only as they go into later stages, as they develop from an egg to an adult, that they start looking different. 
So this suggests that they all have a common ancestor because especially early on in the development, they have to go through a lot of the same steps to go from a single fertilized egg, a single cell, to the millions and billions of cells that make up the adult organism. Two more pieces that I'd like to go through. Um, three more, sorry. Uh, the fossil record, another strong piece of evidence, another early piece of evidence that, that we use to support the theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, fossils, and there's a video link here too that should be on Schoology but is also in this PowerPoint that explains what a fossil is in very good detail. Uh, but briefly, a fossil is uh, what is left behind by an organism that lived uh, thousands to millions to billions of years ago. So it is skeletons, it is footprints, it is poop, it is what is left behind by an organism. And we can see over time from one time period to the next that these fossils change, but they change a little bit. Uh, this is where the idea of the missing link comes in, as a missing link is a um, a fossil that fits in between other fossils as far as having traits. So they have a trait that is somewhere in between what we find in one group of organisms and another group of organisms in the fossil record. Uh, so we see different traits over time. If you went back a billion years ago, everything is a single-celled bacteria. There are no rabbits. There is nothing that has uh, millions of cells working together to where you have a multicellular organism. But as you move through time, you get to about half a billion years ago, about 500 million years ago, you start seeing organisms that have more than a few cells, but you're not going to see anything like us because we don't have those traits evolved yet. Here is another good example. This is the evolution of land animals. I actually hate these diagrams, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, but we have three uh, different species here that were 10 million years are found 10 million years apart uh, in the fossil record. First one, Eustethropteron, is a, a common or is a fish. It looks very much like a fish. Uh, spent all of its time in its water. Uh, the big difference that the Eustethropterans had uh, between fish that we know today is they were called lobe fin fish which means they did have some bones that were similar to what we just talked about in comparative anatomy in their fins. So they had the beginnings of what could be a humerus and the ulna and radius and a little bit of the carpals. So they started having things that looked like the uh, forelimbs, the arms that we have. Uh, 10 million la years later, we found uh, fossils that looked like things that, that started having limbs that looked even more like ours. You can look at the um, picture of the fin underneath it, and you can see there are bones in there that are similar to the humerus, to the radius and the ulna, to the carpals uh, and the metacarpals. We're starting to see bones that are similar to the forelimbs that we find in all animals with backbones. Uh, and lastly, 10 million years later, we have this... Uh, a fossil of a species called that we've called Ichthyostega, uh, which does have, as you can see, all of the bones in the forelimbs that we have. So we already are seeing 365 million ago, years ago the bones that we have in the forelimbs of uh, animals with backbones that have four limbs, that have arms and legs. Now briefly, why I hate this kind of uh, diagram is it suggests that there was a movement, a progression from uh, fish that live in the water to uh, Tiktaalik to Ichthyostega, that this was a progression of animals moving out of the water, of just venturing out. It's not really it. Uh, this is more to suggest the lifestyle. Uh, uh, you stepped around was definitely a fish. It spent all of its time in the water. Tiktaalik was a little more like an alligator. It spent almost all of its time in the water, but it was able to leave the water 
for brief periods, probably to either catch food that was right on the beach or to get out of the water to escape something that was going to try it. And Ichthyosteca still has a lot of fish-like uh, traits, which means it probably spent most of its life in the water, but was able to leave the water and walk around some. So it's almost, even though it kind of went in reverse as far as development, if we were to use like a mammal analogy, uh, Eusteperon is kind of like a dolphin, spends all of its time in the water. Tiktaalik is like a seal where it spends most of its time in the water, but it's okay outside of the water. And Ichthyostega is kind of like an otter where it spends a good deal of its life in the water, but can also spend a lot of time on the beach. So this is not like a progression towards the land. These are different lifestyles where the traits have adapted these organisms to spend time in those lifestyles. Okay, so hope that makes sense. Uh, there again, we have a video that explains more about this, uh, actually that talks about whales. The last two pieces of evidence I want to explain uh, is geographic distribution of species and DNA. Geographic distribution of species is related to fossils. We tend to find organisms that are more closely related to each other live nearer each other. So more closely related species live closer to each other than species that are less related. And the example we're going to give here is placental mammals. All right? Mammals are a group of organisms that evolved from uh, amphibians and reptile-like ancestors um, and plus, uh, evolved into kind of hairy, backboned, four-legged organisms that produce a milk-like substance to feed their babies. Uh, that's where the mammal part comes from, is they're named after mammary glands, which are breasts in humans uh, that produce uh, milk. So large group, um, and somewhere along the line, whenever continents were breaking up and reforming, one group of mammals, one population, developed a new trait called a placenta, which is a pad that connects a developing egg to its parent, to its mother, that allows the mother to continue to give the developing egg its uh, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, and nucleic acids so that the egg can grow bigger. Organisms with eggs, the egg has, has everything that organism can use during development. So uh, the babies that hatch out of eggs are always smaller than the egg because all of the proteins, fats, and carbohydrates that it needs to grow are in the original egg. Mammals that have placentas got around this and are able to make bigger babies than their eggs because they feed the developing uh, organism as it develops. So it's this it's a great adaptation that allows for larger babies that can fend for themselves better. Well this evolved in one group of mammals. Okay? And this was in a larger landmass that included what's now Africa and North America and Eurasia one population developed the placenta and those closely related species with placentas basically spread all over these continents. Whereas the continent that would become Australia was separated from the big continents of North America, Africa, Eurasia, South America, and so on. And so that had a group of mammals that did not develop placentas they lay eggs or they hatch eggs inside of themselves and then they, they feed uh, their babies milk outside. Uh, these are groups called monotremes, which are uh, mammals that lay eggs. They are platypuses and echidnas. Uh, and marsupials, which are uh, kangaroos and um, koalas and that. And they make very tiny little babies that are ha basically hatched from eggs and then they feed them milk outside of their body to help them grow stronger. They're still mammals, they still make milk, but they don't have placentas. And because they were separated, they have been growing and 
developing and evolving on Australia, while the placentals spread throughout the rest of the continents. So all of the mammals on North America, Africa, Eurasia, and South America are more closely related to each other than they are to the mammals on Australia, at least until we started bringing mammals to Australia. I looked this up, an interesting little side note of this is that your belly button is the scar from the place the, from the placenta where you were attached to your mother on, in the womb. So all placental mammals have a belly button when they were attached, which means that koalas and kangaroos do not have belly buttons because they are not placental mammals. Just kind of cool. The last piece of evidence I want to talk about is DNA. This is probably the strongest piece of evidence for evolution. We learned a lot about uh, DNA and how DNA has uh, genes on the polymer of DNA. And these genes are the codes to make proteins that cause traits. So a change in genes is a change in proteins and a change in traits in a population. We also learned about mutations, where mutations are a change in a nucleotide, a change in the letter, which may change the protein, which may change the trait. Okay? And the thing is, is that the mutations happen at kind of a constant rate. So if two species, two populations have more similar DNA, it means they are more closely related and their last common ancestor, their great, 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 great grandparent is more recent than species and populations that have more differences between their DNA. So if there's more distances or more differences in the DNA between two species, it was longer ago that their last common ancestor was. Okay, so this means we can just, we can look at all of the uh, nucleotides in the DNA, figure out what all they are, and then compare two species and get a percentage of how closely related they are. And that tells us how closely related those species are. So for example, uh, with humans, our last common ancestor was also the ancestor for chimpanzees. Just as an aside, this does not mean that we evolved from chimpanzees. It means that chimpanzees and humans shared a great, 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 great grandparent way back, about four million years ago. We had a common parent, grandparent. And because mutation has been happening at a constant rate, it tends to be about one in every 10 billion times that you replicate, that you go through mitosis, for each nucleotide. So very, very rare, but remember you have billions of cells, so you have undergone mitosis billions of times. So you actually have a few new mutations just in you. If we compare our DNA, all of our chromosomes, with all of the chromosomes of chimpanzees, we find that we're about 99% uh, percent similar, which sounds like we're almost exactly the same, but remember, that's all the traits. So that DNA also codes for the trait of doing cellular respiration, of having cell membranes, of having a nucleus of ribosomes. All of those things are things that we share. It's only a couple of things that we uh, are different. Even though those are really important traits, that, yeah, well, most of our traits are almost the same. And they are ones that we really don't think about being differences like doing cellular respiration. And so this shows that we had a common ancestor probably about 4 million years ago. This also shows that all organisms share a common ancestor because you actually share about, or your DNA is identical to uh, like a banana's DNA. You share 41% of DNA with bananas. So your chromosomes are about 41% of your chromosomes are identical to the, the genes on the chromosomes in bananas. Because there again, they also do cellular respiration. 
They are also made of cells. Those cells also have nucleuses. All of these are traits. So this shows that we actually had a common ancestor with bananas as recently as uh, like half a billion years ago. So 500 million years ago, maybe 700 million years ago that we had a common ancestor. Okay. All right. There again, have another video. Uh, this is a video about whales. It's fantastic. Watch this video and we'll come back and summarize what we've learned. Now that we've been briefly introduced to the definition of evolution, why it's a theory, and some of the evidence that support evolution as a theory, let's think about what we're going to be investigating in this unit. Our big driving questions are, how does the environment impact a species over time? And how will a species change or adapt to that environment? We're going to be looking again at sickle cell disease and thinking about that trait in populations and how that has evolved over time. I'd like you to pause in a moment and watch this video on sickle cell disease and why it persists in populations over generations. And I'd like you to make a T-chart uh, on your scrap sheet of paper to record your notes as you watch the video. On this T-chart, you should have one side that says what I notice, which is what you've learned from the video. And the other side is what I wonder. What questions do you still have at the end of this video of, about sickle cell disease and how it's evolved through nat natural selection over time? Okay. So pause this video, watch the one on sickle cell disease, and we'll wrap up once you come back. Now that you've watched the video and recorded what you've noticed and wonder, let's share those uh, observations and wonders. On the Schoology discussion board for this lesson, lesson one of evolution, create a post to share your learning and ideas. List as many learnings as you can. This is the left column of your T-chart. List the questions that you still have about the evolution of sickle cell disease. This is the right column of your T-chart. And how do you think this might relate to things you've learned previously about genetics and inheritance, about DNA to protein traits, about meiosis and independent assortment and alleles? How does this all fit in the evolution of sickle cell disease and therefore the, uh, fit in with evolution uh, in general? Okay, so post those. And we're going to review a little bit of what we learned. First of all, we are going to use th uh, different three questions for this unit, for the evolution unit. You'll need to know, remember what you learned from ecology, population ecology, and the genetics unit to really explain how species evolve over time. First one question is about variation. What differences are there amongst individuals in the population? This is really asking about what differences are there in the traits of the population? What are the different alleles in that population? The second question is about ecology. What factors affect the survival and reproduction of individuals in the population? What traits allow individuals in that population to reproduce more, survive better, and get more food? What are the interactions between those variations in ecology? What changes have occurred in that population over time? Which traits help a species, a population, survive and reproduce better in an environment? So these are the three questions I want you to consider as we move forward through this unit. Let's check your understanding for this lesson. Can you define evolution from a biological standpoint? Can you define scientific theory and explain why evolution is not just a theory? Can you explain what we mean when we say theory in science? And can you identify several things that you notice from that video on sickle cell disease and several questions that you have about sickle cell disease and how it evolved and persisted in populations? So really the T-chart and your posting. Okay, what's next? Go ahead and post that information to the discussion board uh, on your teacher Schoology page. Uh, make a new entry in your new learning tracking tool for the evolution unit titled 1, Evolution Initial Ideas. Explain what we learned in this lesson 
what questions you still have, and self-assess. And it says, consider watching the optional video stated clearly what is evolution. Uh, I would not really consider that optional. It's a little long. That's why we said it's optional. But it's a fantastic video and will really help you with a lot of these concepts. So watch the video stated clearly what is evolution. Okay? So thank you very much for your attention. Be safe, be well, and wash your hands.